and uh, we will get going. So good morning and uh, thanks for, for joining the call today. As many of you are aware, there's been a variety of assistance programs that have kind of come online or back online here uh, recently. And the state of Minnesota did two key things. One is they're gonna be sending through the Department of Revenue checks directly to the businesses that were closed by the most recent governor's order. So that'd be bars, restaurants, fitness centers, um, and event centers, that type of business. And then they sent money to the counties to um, do grants to other small businesses and nonprofits within the communities again. And that's the purpose of the call this morning is to talk about that particular grant program through Steele County. And so what I'd like to do is, I think Scott, I'll, I'll maybe go to you first and have you tee this up and then we can get into some of the particulars of the program. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Brad and good morning everyone. As Brad mentioned, um, the legislation that was passed last month created three buckets of relief, economic relief. Uh, two of them are gonna be distributed directly by the state to those impacted businesses from, particularly from the governor's executive order 2099, the one back in November that kind of shut things down again. The third bucket is what we call the county bucket. Um, that was intended to provide additional relief for profit and nonprofit businesses that were directly or indirectly impacted by um, any of the governor's executive orders. Certainly the, the November one is kind of the, the key one, but um, we were given some flexibility to provide relief where we see there's a, a demonstrated need, where there's a direct or indirect, indirect impact from one of those governor's orders last year. So what we did was uh, we kicked off our program last week. I think some of you probably know we posted our applications and our guidelines. So I think what I'll do is I'll just hit some bullet points here. And then if Keith wants to add something, he can certainly um, chime in too. Uh, I don't know if all of you know Keith Dahl it, from Ellers is the consultant that the county is utilizing to help us process these applications. Keith provided that support during the CARES grant program last year for both the city of Watana and Steele County. We're glad to have Keith back on board again to assist us with this program. This is another one of those um, grant programs that uh, takes on a, another administrative level for us here at the county, which we're really not geared up to handle. So that's why we need some additional support and why we got Keith on board for that. So just jumping into our, our program, um, what we did was um, the county board appointed a committee to help sort of guide us through this process. And the reason we do that is we can move and react and we're much more fluid with the way we can um, take actions and, and get things rolling with a program like this. So the committee consists of two commissioners along with myself, Kathy P. our finance director, and Dan McIntosh, a county attorney. And then of course we have Keith um, on a support basis there. He's kind of our right-hand guy through this. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Rebecca Kubitschek, my executive assistant, really does a lot of work in the day-to-day -day administration of this program too. Um, so she's a great go-to person and a great support person through the last CARES Act grant and as well as this one. So with that, uh, we started our application period in January and what we were trying to do and the way we crafted our applications was really set up to, again, try to, try to allow the businesses and nonprofits to show us how they were impacted. Um, lost revenue, increased expenses, increased demand for services, whatever the case might be. We have check boxes on our, on our application form um, to try to make it as simple as we can for you, but there's also some narrative involved and that's where you really explain how this impacted you. Um, that grant application is, period is open until February 12th. Um, and we kind of set it up that way to allow for 
uh, processing of those applications. And eventually we're going to have to set up some type of ranking or rubric to determine how we're gonna distribute these funds. <clears throat> some of the basic criteria that are involved with this are um, obviously you have to be a business that's physically located within the county. You have to be in good standing with the Secretary of State, no tax liens on the property. Um, and you have to show you were directly or indirectly impacted by an executive order uh, related to the, the pandemic. We did not put a grant limit on, on this uh, program. And we did that for a reason because uh, we wanted to make sure that we got all $715,000 of the grant money out to the community. And if we had set up a, a, a limit on that, as we did with the CARES Act, um, and there was a, an increased need for these funds, uh, we, would, we would be struggling to try to get this out by the deadline, um, which is in March. So that's kind of why we did that uh, this way uh, to allow for that. We're really kind of looking for, since there, were, since there was a CARES Act program and there were some other state and federal programs that helped businesses last year, um, we're kind of looking at that November of last year to March of this year time frame to show, um, you know, where you would use the grant funds to cover the expenses that you have. And they can be used for um, a variety of things and I won't list all of them, they're on the guidelines. Um, so uh, they're right in the application form. Uh, we do want to, in the application, we want to capture, you know, some of the basic details of your business. Um, we want some narrative descriptions and estimated calculations on the negative impacts um, on a business by one of the executive orders. And we want you to show if you have received other grants, please include those on there. There's a section that you can just fill in to include those. We're not uh, excluding anyone that has previously received grant funds. Instead, we wanna capture the, the whole package here, uh, what impact you've had, you know, and you know, less the grants and funding you've received. And then you'll have to propose the, the use for the grants that you're asking for, and then provide some supporting documentation for us. We're using the same email address we had last time, the CRF applications at co.steel.mn.us to submit your applications. And we'll work with you as much as we can on trying to answer questions and get you through this process. We really wanted to make this, I'll be honest with you, we're, with everything that COVID has dealt us, we're, we're flying a little bit by the seat of our pants here. We're trying to with our application simplified, but yet capture all the information that we need to help us with ultimately with distribution of the funds. Uh, I think we started off with an idea, let's simplify this, make it a one page application. Then we realized it's gonna be pretty difficult for us at the end of the, at the process here to get the funds out to those that, that need it the most. So with that, um, Keith, do you have anything to add to those comments? Yeah, yeah, I do have a, a, a few things that I'd like to add. Um, so just to start with, unlike the CARES Act and the program uh, that Steele County and Owatonna and other cities and towns within Steele County had, um, this program, there's a lot less restrictions from the state government. And so we were able to simplify the program and broaden it um, to make operating expenditures to make eligible use of the grant funds a little less restrictive. We still wanna know what you're gonna be spending the grant funds on. So we put some buckets of um, eligible expenses in there, but I mean, it's not a complete list. It's not an exhaustive list. So if there are other expenses that you've had that you think would be eligible, feel free to reach out to us and, and, and walk us through what the expense is and, and how you think it applies. The second thing is we talk about a direct impact and an indirect impact. And what this is specifically referencing is to any one of the executive orders that was issued by the state of Minnesota. So if you're a direct impact 
you would have been directly referenced in one of the executive orders. So that's where you would have a direct impact. An indirect impact is one where a business that you provide services to or um, an executive order didn't specifically reference you to close or reduce your operations, but it indirectly impacted you because you weren't, into, you weren't able to go into people's homes. Travel was substantially reduced and so you didn't have enough guests stay at your hotel. So essentially, we're just trying to figure out if you were directly referenced in an executive order or if an executive order indirectly impacted your business and your operations. Um, and then the third thing that I wanted to add is the intent of the state legislation was for the county program to be a, a catch-all. So with the, the first round of funding coming from the Department of Revenue going to bars, restaurants, wineries, bowling alleys, um, caterers, and so forth, um, that's going to be going out mid to late January. They have the second bucket, which is movie theaters and event centers, and that's going to be going out after the first round. But then the third bucket, which is the county, is supposed to be a catch-all, um, trying to get as, as much funding out to the businesses uh, that need it and nonprofits that need it the most. Um, so while we tried to simplify the application because it was a catch-all, we had to um, get as much information to, to make an educated decision or an, an, an evaluate the application to ensure um, that there was an impact uh, related to an executive order in, in COVID-19. All right, terrific. Um, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Scott, for the, the overview there. One, one point of clarification too that I wanted to ask about real quick. Uh, is that the businesses that receive the Department of Revenue dollars are also eligible for this grant, correct? Correct. That's correct. They're, they're also eligible for this program. All right. And if, uh, if people haven't been online yet, uh, it is out there on the Steele County website. You can Google and go right to their homepage and they've got it in the lower right corner, or um, we also have it on our Chamber resource page too. Uh, at this point, let's, uh, let's open it up for questions that anybody might have. Uh, Scott and Keith, uh, curious on the application um, where you have the PPP, small business loan, economic injury grant, uh, Steel County Cares and City Cares. For grants that have been received that were intended to be forgiven but are not, do you want us to put the entire amount of the grant or do you want us to put the amount that's been forgiven and the rest is a loan? PPP, for example, many of us that couldn't reopen to 100% are not getting our PPP uh, money completely forgiven at this point? Um, yeah, I, I guess what I would recommend is put, put it down as a loan that's not going to be forgiven. If it is going to be forgiven, maybe break that out into an other section or attach a note to it that's with what's going to be forgiven. We just want to understand what the business has already received as far as assistance from CARES and we tried to, to capture all the programs, uh, loan and grants out there, but I realized we may not have captured everything uh, that was available to businesses and nonprofits. Um, but essentially we just wanna understand what the impact was to your business and then the assistance that you've already received. Okay, what, um... Who's going to be reviewing the financials that are submitted and are they public record? Um, so I will be reviewing the financials and with this program, I'll, I'll say we're not being very strict on what documents you have to submit. We've given you a general idea of what we'd like to see. Um, but if you want to provide some document that isn't your tax return or anything like that, maybe it's just a profit and loss statement or something, 
um, you're able to submit that. We just want to verify um, and substantiate your gross revenue and your employees and so forth. Um, as far as what the information you sit, submit becoming public record, um, it, it does become public data and entities can request that information, but there is a restriction on what information can be provided from the data that you submit. So we're not gonna release your um, financial statements. We're not gonna release some of the, the market analysis if you submit some of that. We're not gonna submit um, specific information about your employees, um, any social security numbers, tax ID numbers or anything like that. Um, it, it, essentially what we release is the, what the business name is, the address, and contact information. Um, essentially what it comes down to if a business is, or another local government entity is requesting information about um, who are the applicants that receive funding, we would also release information about the amount of uh, grants that you requested or the grant that you received and so forth. So it's not specific information about your business or your financial or market data. It's, it's essentially contact information that we would be sharing. Do you have the uh, maybe called rules of engagement figured out? Do you know how you're going to make these decisions? Um, it'd be nice for us when we're applying to understand how's the decision going to be made. You know, we went through the Otana Cares round. We have two bar restaurants. Uh, unfortunately, just to simplify some tax issues we file them both under one federal tax id number um and in that round of of money it didn't matter if you had one business two business if you had lost uh eight hundred thousand dollars of revenue or fifty thousand dollars of revenue everybody got the same amount um how is that going to be handled this time and how are you going to make the decisions about who gets who gets what and is there any supporting documentation that would that would help that along? Because there are people that are in far worse shape than others. Scott, did you want to address the first part of that question or did you want me to? Yeah, so related to the tax ID and the, the restriction kind of with the CARES grant, Corey, um, this one, we, are, we don't have a, a maximum grant amount. So if you have one tax ID and you have multiple businesses under there, you're gonna request whatever you feel your need is, you know, what your impact was and what your need is on the application. So it won't come into play like it did with CARES if you have multiple um, businesses under one ID number. I think that's maybe the answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. And then as far as how we're going <clears> to <throat> review applications on the back end and, and determine how much grant would be requested, it's still something that we have to flush out with the committee that we're working with right now. Uh, but what I can tell you is with the information that we have on the application, um, that information would be used. So um, we take into account a business that may have already received a grant from the Department of Revenue in the first round, compare their NAICS code to um, the NAICS codes that were already given funds for the first bucket, the second bucket. We'd also take a look at total number of employees, um, your gross revenue loss and, and, and so forth. So there, there's still things that we need to flush out, but with the information that's on the application, that's what we're gonna be reviewing against other applicants um, so that we don't have to submit or send any money back to um, the state. We can use all of the money that we received within Steele County. We're just trying to figure out a way of um, dividing it up in, in the best way that the committee thought um, to do that was not putting a max on the grant request just to see what the true need is for a business or, or nonprofit within Steele County. What if you have a uh, NAICS code that is not accurate or you have multiple NAICS code under one uh, ID number? 
So I, I guess you're specifically referring to your business. I, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to get some more information about that. All right, I'll attach a note. Okay. Um, I think it's possible, correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, but you could put multiple NACE codes on the application under the one ID number, I think, couldn't you? Correct. Yep, you, you could put multiple NACE codes down under um, one business. All right. Could, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the direct impact um, businesses? Um, so the nature of my business, uh, we haven't been in business long enough to uh, get the automatic payment from the state. And we are a directly impacted business by the um, uh, order 2099. Uh, it kind of leaves us in a gap. And, and we were advised that this uh, funding through the county would be the the uh, the positioning for this so i'm just wondering what kind of priority is going to be put on direct impacted business yeah that's that's one of the things so um say you are uh directly referenced in an executive order and you were required to close but you weren't eligible for the department of revenue because you weren't open in 2019 for them to compare year-over-year -year revenue loss to get 30 percent that's another one of the factors that would be taking a look at. So, I mean, if you're required to close, you've essentially lost almost all of your income. Um, so that would just necessitate that you do have a need, an obvious need. And so that's what the intent of this program is for. Okay. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And you're, and by the way, you're the second one we've heard from Bill that, that has fallen under that situation where they were not open last year. They didn't, the state didn't have 2019 revenue to compare to 2020. So um, it's obviously out there that there's direct impact of businesses that did not receive any funding. So we want to capture that in, in the application and you can certainly do that. Yep, that's helpful. Thank you. I, I assume, you know, and I, I do appreciate the concepts about being ultra flexible with this. I'll, I'll try not to write a, a, a thesis um, in support of our, our application, but uh, we are, and I think like with Corey's situation, there's just so many unique uh, situations here. And, you know, we find ourselves in a business not eligible for PPP or forgivable PPP either because of the nature of our business with a new business and rising receipts into a summer, which allowed us to open the patio, which just by natural positioning um, brought increased revenue, but it was significantly reduced based on what it could have been had COVID not been here. So I'll just articulate that and I'll provide you that insight. And, and uh, um, I, I, I appreciate the, the discernment in the review. So thank you. And I'll also add that if, if you need more information to explain your circumstance that maybe a box on the application doesn't allow you to put everything into, attach something else as a supporting document or something like that. That, that would be helpful just so that we can understand more of the narrative. I live my life rarely being bound by lines and, and borders. So <laughs> <laughs> you'll be hearing from me. <laughs> Good questions. Other, other questions uh, out there with the group? Can, uh, can you guys address the the timing once again? I know the deadline's the February 12th. When do you anticipate checks actually going out at this point? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so February 12th is the deadline, and then we allowed a week from that deadline to capture additional information if needed. Um, it seems like with these programs, the <laughs> We encourage you to get your applications in as soon as possible, but um, very much so, so we can get rolling on some of our work on this end. But we know that there's going to be a lot of businesses just because of the fact that this is so up close against year end and you're trying to capture some financial information. You might have to wait a little bit to get that. But we, we're allowing February 19th kind of as the deadline to, with the applications coming in, a lot of them probably that last week. To get any additional information, Keith will be sending out those emails requesting something if he needs clarification. And then the committee will start its work. We, we certainly will be working on our rubric, sort of our ranking and prior, priority um, system prior to this. So we're sort of geared up to 
to hit the ground running when the applications come in. But um, we have to, uh, we'll have to, you know, capture all of those applications and review them, you know, through probably through February into early March. And then we have a March 15th deadline imposed by the state to make awards with a final, final check cutting deadline being April 1st. So I'm going to say, you know, we're probably going to start getting checks out in you know, mid-March time frame. Okay, thank you. The hey, uh, Keith, just one more question on on kind of your methodology here. Um, you know, there's again, there's such a difference in businesses. Are you going to be focusing on operating income, net income, taxable income? I mean, you you're going to see potentially unforgivable income come in in an other income area on a profit loss statement. Some businesses have huge amounts of depreciation that they can capture depending on where they're at in the life cycle of their business and the size of their facilities and whether they own their facilities or rent. I mean, it just seems like this is going to be a nightmare to try to come up with a fair process and, you know, and what information do you want and what information really don't you want that's going to muddle this up? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. We're, we're requesting the gross revenue. And so, yes, with everything you just mentioned, it's not going to be a perfect scenario for everything because there's, there's so many different scenarios out there. Um, but with everything coming in, with the information that we're requesting, we're, we're trying to understand what the impact is with a simple application as possible. So, I mean, and, and like I said, this is something that we still have to flush out with, with the committee, um, but are they gonna to wanna to focus on smaller businesses versus larger businesses that may have those assets and those depreciating values and so forth? Um, that's why we're requesting the gross revenue. That's why we're trying to understand total number of employees so that we can take all of those factors into consideration and, and try and come up with an equ equitable way to distribute these, these funds that we have and get them out to businesses that need them the most. And I realize that um, the small business community, um, if you're looking at a company that's under 150 employees, definitely needs assistance right now. Um, just because they don't have access to some of those larger bucket of funds that have been available through the CARES Act. So, I mean, these, these are all the things that we're taking into consideration as we're trying to come up with an equitable way to distribute the funds at the committee level. Um, and, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're going to put out some information after we come up with a rubric on how we're going to score these applications, correct? Yeah, you we'll know, one try to... We'll try to continue to provide as much information as we can about that. And I wasn't kidding when I said we, we are flying by the seat of our pants here. I mean, we, we uh, just got the funds from the state here about a week and a half ago. Um, and we had been working on the applications to try to get the, just get the program rolling, knowing we were up against the deadline in March. So we're, we're really doing the best we can to try to try to capture, um, the intent of the legislation and and try to get the, the needs identified and get the limited funds we have, which is the 715,000 out there where we think it's, you know, it's most needed in our community. Um, we're hoping for, and I don't think we're gonna have a problem with oversubscription of our program, but um, that also is gonna ultimately help define some of these things that we'll be looking at, you know, because uh, we'll, we'll have to see what we get for the demand on the funding and that will, that will help sort of, I guess, on the back end, if you will, determine some of the, the things that we need to do. So I've been through the application, I've got it up in front of me, and I just don't see maybe some of the right numbers, okay? We have new businesses like Bill's business here. We have old businesses that are probably going to apply. There's no accounting for 
to what degree they're leveraged. You have businesses that rent a building that have very little assets and probably have zero leverage. So they have no debt service. If you look at their P&L, you're not really going to know if they have enough actual cash flow to service their debt. You know, a P&L is a P&L, right? It's what did you do? But did you do enough to actually service what your obligations are? And your obligations are beyond your expenses on your P&L. Hi, this is Oscar. I have a question. I know uh, this is, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, everyone who's put some work into this to um, to help us all um, appreciate everyone's support and help and due diligence. I know it's not a perfect method or a perfect answer or a fix-all, uh, but I, I do appreciate everyone uh, working on this. Uh, my only concern from what I'm hearing is the 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 time out to get disbursements out. Uh, I mean, we're, we're you're, I think you've mentioned uh, um, disbursements and you know probably the end of March and start seeing checks in April. So that that's that's like almost summer. So um, I know it's not a perfect um, you know process, uh, but I'm wondering if there's a way to move that timeline up. Yeah, good question. Um, I think we'll just we'll take that into consideration. I think again, try to capture that in your application, how critical it is, you know, in terms of your your current situation, the timeline part of it. Yeah, and and, and just to add, I mean the 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 fixed dates that aren't going to change are when the application deadline is on February twelfth. And when we need additional information, if there is additional information necessary for your application by February 19th. Um, our, our goal is to review these applications as they come in and send out emails requesting the additional documents um, as, as, as soon as we get the applications or within a week of receiving your application is <clears throat> our ideal time frame, so that you have as long as you need until February 19th to get that additional documents in. So I, I would encourage you to submit applications early so that you can understand what additional documents, if anything, we will need to do our review. Um, but once we get past that February 19th deadline, I mean, we, we can shoot to try and get the checks out sooner, but there can be no guarantees. So I mean, um, that's the, the variable, that's the flux. So it just depends on how many applications we get and everything that we have to evaluate. So um, I, I, I agree, I, I, I hope we get the funds out sooner than what our tentative schedule is, um, but we'll just have to, to wait and see. Thank you. I don't know if there's uh... Uh, an easy answer to Corey's question from before either as we sit here today, but uh, obviously highlights the complexities of uh, the various businesses and how this shakes out for everybody a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, we could also continue that piece of the conversation offline as well, unless you've got any additional thoughts on maybe how that could be done in the application process. Uh, I just didn't want to lose that thought either. No, I, we haven't, I've taken some notes here too. Um, I, I think maybe the best way, I, these are great questions and good points to bring up. I think one thing to sort of keep in mind is we're dealing with a very finite amount of money. And as Keith alluded to, this is intended to be a catch-all, I guess. And, and the money was distributed to the counties based on population. So you know, we have a limited amount of funding and this is not going to be the cure-all um, to all of the needs that are out there. That, that's, I think, becoming clear as this, uh, this session continues here. There's, there's a lot of needs out there. Um, so we're going to have to try to, we're going to do our best to try to um, get this out in a manner that we think will be at least somewhat impactful for some businesses out in the community. But it's... Um, 
it's not definitely not going to cure the ills of the pandemic and all of the, the problems that, that many of you are facing. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, any other questions uh, that people have here as we're as we're speaking with with Scott and Keith about the county grant program that is uh, that is in effect. I did put the link in the chat too. If uh, people don't have it, uh, you can access the grant application there as well. Other questions. Okay. Hearing none at the moment, we uh, we can uh, move move towards wrapping this up. I would just say that as questions do come up, um, you're always welcome to reach out to us at the chamber. I would also suggest uh, that both Scott and Keith are great resources for this. Keith has been through it as he mentioned before and has been very responsive to questions. So. Um, I, I would have no doubt that he'll be very responsive again as you're working through the process. So, um, and that, and Keith, if people need to get in touch with you, um, is the email for the application, does that also go to you so they could use that? Um, it doesn't go to me. Um, it goes to Rebecca Kubacek at the county. Um, so if they want to get in contact with me, um, I would say that they can use my email if they have it, um, or they can first reach out to the county, see if the county has the, the answer that they're looking for. If not, they can send that question to me and then I'll reach out directly. Okay. Yeah, just, I would just say, just send it to us. We'll get it to Keith. <laughs> you know, we'll okay. make sure that's our process we've got in place. So we don't want to, I mean, from our standpoint, we do also want to see what's coming in. You know, we want to be, want to, want to have a finger on the pulse of what's going on too. Um, and Keith does a great job of keeping us informed, but I think that's the best process. Just send it to that CRF applications and we'll we'll definitely get, get it to Keith if we can't handle it. Hey Scott, can sure. you uh, give us the rest of that email? I just didn't see it on the application here. Maybe it's there, but I'm not seeing it right off the top of my head. CRF applications at co dot steel okay dot mn dot us dot us okay all right yeah so, and it, thanks guys on, thanks guys for all your effort on this appreciate it all right um, yes Scott and Keith thank you for for all your work here and we'll obviously continue this discussion but this was a great uh, great opportunity to get the the word out. Thanks everybody for joining today on the call and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk with you all soon. Thanks for being on. Have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.